Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and in today's interview, I'm talking to Christopher Peterson about Greenland. So this is a fascinating discussion because I've got to tell you, I don't like the cold and I had never really considered travelling to Greenland, but I've read some of Chris's books and it's just fascinating area. And you can hear in my voice that I'm definitely sceptical at the beginning, but by the end, I am fascinated by the country and I want to head off to the ice. And Christopher writes these Arctic thrillers and they do give a really forbidding sense of the dangers of Greenland and also how hardy and resilient the people there are. So we talk about some of the more unusual food you might encounter, uh, the serious sledge patrol, things you might want to visit, as well as how respect for culture is so critical when you travel to very different places. So Greenland is in the news these days uh, because of climate change and the melting of the ice sheet, as well as for political reasons, as President Donald Trump offered to buy Greenland from Denmark in August 2019. Now, Greenland is in a very strategic uh, physical position and is also potentially very rich in oil, gas and rare earth minerals. But of course, the Greenlanders have said their country belongs to them. It's not for sale. (laughs) And the Danes have rejected all calls for discussion. So it's a very interesting time. And it's clear that Greenland will continue to feature in the global news, even though it has a tiny population of around uh, 56,000 people, I think, in such a big country. So we recorded this interview before all this recent news kicks off, but Christopher is quick off the mark and is writing a speculative novella about a near future Greenland based on the potential of what the US might do to secure it. It's called Arctic State and will be available in November 2019. Chris's books are excellent and I've already pre-ordered that based on my interest in the area and now the news. I think it's really interesting to potentially hear his take on that. Um, So I hope you find the interview interesting today. Let's get into the interview. Christopher Peterson writes Arctic noir crime thrillers based on the seven years he spent living in Greenland, including Seven Graves, One Winter, the first book in the Greenland crime series, and The Ice Star, an action-adventure thriller for fans of Matthew Riley, which I just went out and got immediately because I love Matthew Riley, but welcome, Chris. (laughs) Thank you, Joe. It's great to be here. Oh, it's so it's great to have you on the show and just a fascinating area of the world. So tell us a bit more about how you came to live and work in Greenland and write about the Arctic. Well, it really started with uh, Jack London stories, you know, reading under the under the duvet at night with the torch when mum's told me I've got to go to sleep. But I just couldn't drop that whole Arctic and Alaska and um, Canada and the, the Mounties. I mean, you know, reading about the Mounties is wonderful. Um But that progressed over time. And I actually went to the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, where I uh, studied outdoor education. And there was one night in the library when I was actually flipping through National Geographic. And there was one of those one page adverts for high end watches. And there's this guy and his beard is just completely covered with ice. And he's wearing a parka. He's in a snowstorm and there's a couple of huskies around him. And it talked about the Danish Sirius Sledge Patrol. And I just thought, yes, I've got to do that. That's what I'm going to do with my life. And I started doing a lot of different um, different work with huskies. In uh, yeah, I went to Alta in Norway, and I went to uh, Maine in the in the states, and I also went to Thetford in Norfolk, <laughs> <laughs> which you know they do have huskies down there. But the interesting thing was when it was when I met my wife in the Highlands of Scotland. She's Danish, and um, we got to know each other. We fell in love, and we got married. And I just thought, this is it. We're going to Denmark. I can join the Sirius Sledge Patrol. And I can go to Greenland and live out my dream until I realized the only thing you can't be in the Sirius Sledge Patrol is married. <laughs> so, <gasps> so it's one, one of those, right, well, okay, good job I love my wife because I'm, I'm stuck here now. <laughs> 
So that was really the start of it. Um, but I, looking north, I mean, I, I'm not one of those people who wants to travel the world. I'd rather get to know one place really, really well. It just so happens that I've chosen the whole Arctic, as it were. Um, and I'm steadily getting to know different places. And Greenland um, was where I ended up. I trained to be a teacher in Denmark and took my first teaching job in Greenland. And that was the start of it, really. Um, and of course, I know I know the north of Greenland better than the south. Um, I, I haven't really been to the south. And when I say south, I mean south of the Arctic Circle. Ah. So, <laughs> so my first job was um, 600 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle on an island called Umanak, which means heart-shaped. And it's basically a heart-shaped island in the, middle of, uh, in the middle of nowhere. But I didn't know it was an island. And when I got the job, I turned to Yena and I said, well, we better look this place up. So, of course, we turned to Google. And I turned to her and I said, we're going to an island. And we were going there for an unlimited period of time. And it was quite a commitment. Um, and just the whole thing, I mean... It's very difficult. And of course, within a short space of an interview, you can't really get a, you can get a flavor for Greenland, but it's one of those things you really have to experience because everything that you think you know about the world is just different. So mm. it's a very different culture and a very different mode and transport and a mode of living or a lifestyle because you're very close to the edge. Um, and that's what appeals to me in my writing as well. The, the environment really is uh, a character. Um, yeah, and and it's interesting because you say that close to the edge. I've read, you know, a bit a bit of of your books. So, you know, I've dipped into a few of them, and that close to the edge. I think you've really captured that in your books, actually, because it made me more afraid of Greenland. I was like, <laughs> whoa, this is. It, I think people. Well, let's let's just be clear at the beginning, because I think in my mind I get mixed up with Iceland, and I think a lot of people do. So, can you explain where is Greenland? Well, Greenland, if you, if you imagine uh, that Iceland is, should we say it's to the north and east? Or, oh, I'm, I'm going to lose it now. It's certainly <laughs> north of Scotland. <laughs> west. Let's go northwest. <laughs> Let's go northwest. Let's do that. Oh, this is brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> However, I'll say that um, if you go even further west from Iceland, you will hit the tip of Greenland. Or you'll hit, uh, you'll hit the east coast. And there are actually day trips from Iceland to the east coast of Greenland. Um, but Greenland is just, it's just massive. It's huge. Um, and the populated, a populated areas are predominantly around the West coast. Um, and again, on the East up to the, uh, again, up to the Arctic circle, but it only, uh, localized in two larger areas. But Greenland is basically an ice mass on, you know, it's obviously an ice sheet. It's melting as we know, and it's melting quite rapidly compared to how it has fur uh, before. Um, so really, it's, it's the place on the map where they usually put the legend because there's a big open space where you can write stuff. You know, if you look at an atlas... Yeah, and and, a lot of, mm, sorry, yeah. I, I was going to say, I think what, what was so interesting reading your work, I, I didn't know that Greenland was Danish, but this also seems to be a point of contention. So what, what is this thing between Canada and Denmark and Greenland? Yes, and this is quite interesting in the sense that the Danish uh, Sirius Sledge Patrol, patrol there's these uh, teams of uh, two guys and 11 dogs. Um, there are four teams, and they patrol the northeast Greenland to maintain sovereignty for the Danish crown because uh, Greenland belongs to Denmark, and that sounds awful, but it's basically a colony. However, when you look at what we Brits have done over, over time, they've actually really looked after uh, the Greenlanders uh, compared. There's lots of things that are issues that uh, need to be worked out. But Greenland would really like to be independent. But when people ask me about that, we don't want to go into politics, but ultimately, if Scotland struggles to be independent and Scot Scotland has resources and an infrastructure, Greenland will really struggle to be independent because it only has 56,000 people. So, Whoa, that's like, that's nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's a small, that's City. a small town yeah. in, in Britain, yeah. really. And there are no roads, or rather there are roads in the towns, but there are no roads connecting towns. So if you want to travel in Greenland, you have to travel by plane, by helicopter, sometimes both. You can take a boat, but of course, in the winter, you're restricted to the conditions of the water or maybe even the sea ice. So that's what I try and work into my stories as well, that there's a lot of sledging with dogs. Uh, there's a lot of skidoos. 
Um, but this is also a culture that's dying because the more that the, the climate affects the temperature in Greenland, then tragically the, the, the way of life of the hunter is being far more, well, it's under threat. And they can't sustain the number of dogs they've had before because they simply can't get out on the ice. Um, that's kind of a, a segue, but it's more to say that this is not an easy place to get around. And it's certainly not cheap for travellers either. Yes, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like, um, so, so just, I'm just trying to get a sense of the, the character of people. I mean, you, there's something about you that wants to go that far, having, you know, come from yeah. Britain, Britain, which, you know, in parts of Britain, there's some space, but I mean, there's some serious space, it sounds like in Greenland. But what's, what is the, the, the culture of the people like? Um, you know, are they very independent? Do they, I mean, that 56,000 people, is that all spread out? So they live in smaller yeah. communities? They are spread out. Um, the capital of Nuuk has about uh, 15,000 people. And that's the, one of the biggest uh, uh, conglomerations of people, you could say. Um, further north, you've got smaller towns, a couple of thousand people, or maybe up to you know, three or 4,000 people. But then you've got villages and surrounding settlements. So we're really talking about places that could have um, maybe 60 people, or maybe they've got 100 people. And then Karnak, where I was in the very north, it was about 800 miles south of the Arctic Circle. There was just about 600 people there. Um, and that's, that's one of the larger settlements. So really, you've got um, people spread out all over the place, but, but they kind of know each other because there's a lot of traveling going on for those people, certainly, that are in a position to travel between the towns and the settlements. But family, you talked about you know typical the culture of Greenland. Well, family and people, there's a strong bond. Um, it's also, they're also very um, affected by the weather. And this is one of the things about Greenland is very spontaneous. So you and I, with our Western background, might say, well, shall we meet on Tuesday at four o'clock? That sounds like a really good idea. But a Greenlander will say yes, but they'll probably come the previous, or the, they'll come on Sunday at one o'clock because that's when the weather was good. <laughs> you cannot know that the Tuesday is going to be good for traveling. And that spontaneity um, really defines who they are as a people. Um, also, as you say, living on the edge, you really want to make the most of um, everything in your life. So you don't live for tomorrow. You live for right now because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, and I, I got that sense. So let's come back to that serious um, sledge patrol because you said yep. you can't be married. And that implies that there is a, I guess, a danger of death and they don't want family people there because of, of the danger. It, it, so, and you give the sense of that in your writing. But what, what are the, um, I guess, what, what is that uh, sledging like and working with the dogs? I mean, you, you've done that. Because um, people, if they come to Greenland, that is going to be a mode of transport, isn't it? It is. And it's very accessible for um, tourists if they come to the East Coast, for example. So a typical tourist or a traveller might come from Iceland, fly to the East Coast of Greenland. And if it's in the right period of uh, you know, time of the year, they can book a trip and travel by dog sled. Um, also in East Greenland, there's a lot more, they can travel on the, um, on the land, um, as well as on the sea ice. Um, whereas where, when I had my dogs, I had a, had a team of 13 dogs in the end. Um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's fabulous work, but it's also one of those things where in my third year of sledging, I, I got it. It finally started to click. Whereas the first two years. I could see the, the Greenlanders, my neighbors, nudging each other and saying, right, let's get the camera out because Chris is going out with the dogs again. You know, <laughs> it could be entertaining. Um, but the, the serious patrol, of course, it's very different. But the reason, uh, one of the reasons I believe that they, they don't want people to be married is because you can't have any distraction because you are very reliant on your, your, your partner and the dogs to survive because they have their rations and they are traveling for a couple of months at a time, they have resupply areas, but they need to be able to function. Um, it's not a place for prima donnas. It's not a place for anyone who, they, they really need to know that they can do what they say they can do. Um, NASA has actually used um, psychological profiles and, uh, and um, what they called, research from the serious, serious ledge patrol. 
to see how they could do, devise similar training programs for astronauts. So if you imagine being in the middle of, on uh, the top of Greenland alone is a bit like going to Mars, then we're starting to get somewhere where you can realize the environment really does define you and how you, how you function. Wow. It, I mean, it does seem pretty hardcore. Like in my mind, visiting, I was like, oh, we're talking about Greenland and started reading your books and started looking at the map and going, oh, this is not Iceland. Because to me, Iceland is, you know, has quite a reputation for travellers, for some parties, for some nice waterfalls, <laughs> but yeah. not as extreme, whereas Greenland seems, you know, much more extreme. So if, if people want to visit, because obviously it's going to attract a certain type of adventurer, a bit like yourself, <laughs> um, what are the places in Greenland that a traveller might visit? Because obviously most people are not going to spend a couple of years doing dog sledding <laughs> on teaching like you. But what are some of the places that you would recommend visiting? Well, a lot of travellers actually come uh, on cruise ships. And there are there's the high-end adventure cruise ship option, which costs um, lo a lot of money. It costs mm. tens of thousands of pounds to go on one of these high, uh, um, high, high end cruises. And they're, they're usually like the Russian icebreakers and they will come to the places where I lived. Um, but there are cheaper options where you can actually come on a cheaper cruise ship. And that will typically visit places like Nuuk, the capital, um, which is basically a modern city. It, it's very reminiscent of like cities in Canada, in Northern Canada, um, with all the mod cons, um, you know, e everything's good. It's, it's very accessible uh, everything works. And then you would go further to a place called, a town called Iluluset. And Iluluset is where they have one of the fastest or the fastest um, carving glacier uh, in Greenland. It's actually not the fastest. That was near Umanak, but it's the biggest. Um, and we're carving, it's carving icebergs the size of small city blocks or even large city blocks. You mean off they're falling the off? They're, yes, they're, they're simply breaking off. Um, and that's, um, that's when you see, when you see an iceberg that's slowly moving past the town, it's very slowly, um, but it's bigger than the buildings on the town. It's reaching up higher and you know, that's just the, what is it? Do they say the ninth? <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> one part of nine <laughs> that you can see. These things are huge. Um, Ilula said is the place where a lot of travelers would go and they would get a fabulous experience. Um, they would be able to see the modern Greenland. And they would also be able to explore the old, uh, older cultural Greenland, um, where you get a lot of uh, an influence of the hunting community and the fishing community. Um, Iluluset is in the it's in the uh, council called Kashwitsu commune, uh, commune, and um, that is basically the hunting area. So it's the area I know best, and I lived north of that. Um, you could also go to the east, which is uh, far more accessible in terms of traveling from Iceland. And you could go to a place called Desilak. And Desilak is um, the town, uh, there's two main towns on the East Coast. And it's the town south of Ishokotomit, which is the place where I set um, the Ice Star, a lot of what happened there. These places, again, Desilak is set up for tourists. So you can easily get onto uh, different opportunities to travel and experience the Greenlandic way of life. Um, the south of Greenland, which sadly I don't know very well at all, is far more accessible and you can actually fly to a, um, uh, an airport further south so you don't have to go to Nuuk. But whatever you do, any traveler has to be aware that they have to fly one way or another. And that travel will be affected by the weather and typically fog. Fog is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it just, just stops everything. Um, what people could do when they went to these different places is, again, opportunities where you get the chance to taste the local food, to meet with, with Greenlanders. And a lot of guide companies now are doing, there's fantastic opportunities for young Greenlanders, especially to train to be tourist guides. And a lot of my old students are actually leading tourist groups now, which is fabulous because they speak Greenlandic, they speak Danish, they speak English, sometimes they speak a bit of German. And then you get a really young, excited, um, and very competent guide who knows everything. It's wonderful. Instead of a European guide who's learned a bit from Wikipedia. <laughs> so, so, are the, so these Greenlanders, is there, is there an indigenous people who are Greenlanders or are they descended from uh, the colony as such? They, they were there before the Danes came. So they are indigenous. Now, 
whether they came from Siberia or from Canada, please don't ask me because <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not good on that bit. Um, but they are Greenlanders and they they were there before the Danes came. And then the Danish missionaries came after the long after the Vikings came. You've got Eric the Red and he came to the to the south and he called Greenland green. Um, and then you've got the missionaries that came in the oh, I'm really useless at the the dates, but in the 17, 18, late 1700s. Mm. You know what? That's probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the missionaries came later than the Vikings. The missionaries, you know what? That sounds fabulous. <laughs> that is good. And basically, they did what they do. And they decided to help out the, the local population, the indigenous population, and everything changed from there. Let's say help but out in inverted commas. <laughs> we will do that. Um, but what you have to remember as well is that the things I do know is like Greenlanders, they only had television like, you know, 30, 40 odd years ago. Um, but now they've got mobile phones, smartphones, mm. they've got internet. I mean, internet is incredibly expensive in Greenland. Um, we had internet via a satellite dish in Karnak. We paid a hundred pounds a month for, I think it was, I think we had four megabytes of traffic before we had to pay per megabyte. Oh goodness. So I watched a trailer for a new film that I'd love to see, but couldn't cause there was no cinema. Um, that would be my monthly um, megabyte use gone. And then we'd pay a lot of money per megabyte up and down. But the reason I, why did I mention that? I was, <laughs> was talking about, that. yes. Yeah, the young Greenlanders, yeah. Young Greenlanders. A wonderful image that I have in my mind is a cruise ship arriving in Umanak and you know, disgorging a huge amount of tourists. And they've all got these jackets on. They're all wearing the life jackets. I think they're told, don't take the life jacket off, uh, even when you're on land. And they give out balloons and crayons and sweets to the Greenlanders, the kids. And I just remember seeing this kid with his mobile behind his back, texting his friends, saying something like, hey, they're here again. Come and get crayons. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that they were sort of people oh. who'd never seen a cruise ship before and didn't have the internet. And uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, th things have definitely changed. But let's um, let's just cover some of the, um, I guess, some of the, the, so you've talked about the internet there, but the food. So when you said people could sample what um, the food is like and the hunting area. So what type yeah. of food might people try in Greenland? Well, one of the things that they would probably get the opportunity to experience is called a kafamik. And a kafamik is this wonderful concept of a birthday party or a celebration party of some kind. Um, it could be a confirmation because the Greenlanders, they all get confirmed around age 14, 15. Um, so there's a deep um, belief in the Lutheran um, re um, Christian religion. Um, so a kafamik would be where you and I would turn up and we would work our way through three tables the first table would be savory goods that they've caught. The second table would be coffee and cakes. And then the third table would be perhaps a liqueur and some chocolates. And then you go out again. Now you can spend 15 minutes or you can spend two hours, depending on the flow of traffic <laughs> of people, <laughs> but you don't come for four hours. Um, the kind of foods that they would have, my wife loves something called reiklinger. That's a Danish word for strips of halibut that have been hung up to dry. And you just tease it off the strip of skin and it's, it just melts in your mouth. So it's fish, uh, of course. Um, you can eat anything that moves. Um, <laughs> the Greenlandic chicken is what you and I would call a seagull. So basically, <laughs> it is. I remember one guy trying to sell me three Greenlandic chickens and I, you know, I just didn't so want So they seagull. say this is chicken and we would say that is seagull. <laughs> They, they say chicken, but they've got a smile in their, in their eyes. They know what they're doing. <laughs> but um, reindeer, um, and this is where it gets controversial, all kinds of whales. I mean, literally. Um, and then seal. And um, I've eaten polar bear. I've eaten, I've eaten walrus. That's a bit tough at times. Um, but one of the, the special things that I should mention is really far north, you get what's called kiviak. And kiviak is when you take a small bird, an auk, a UK, mm -hmm. and they catch them in nets and they put them inside a seal skin. So inside an actual seal and they bury it for three months with rocks. And what happens is that the, the auk with all its feathers ferments. So when you pull open the seal or pull it out of the rocks after three months, you can take one of these orcs and you can um, tease the meat off. And it's like cheese. It's like incredibly ripe cheese. 
It's, you are not selling this. <laughs> I'm not selling it. And you know what? The fun thing is that if you imagine the Kafamig, I mentioned the confirmation, there might be several confirmations in one day. So the idea is that you move around these birthday celebrations or confirmation celebrations. And typically they will have kivyak at each one. And that's the savory table. And in the far north, in the hunting communities, that table is actually cardboard boxes opened up on the floor of the kitchen. And that's where you sit and you sit, simply sit on the floor and eat it. Now, that fermented meat is, is basically alcohol because it's, you know, it's mm. become alcohol. Mm. So the kids, especially the small ones, by the time they've been to one or two kafamik, they are absolutely high because they, <laughs> you know, they're, they're drunk on meat. Um, so I know I'm not selling it, but that's just the wait, way it wait, is. Wait, tell me again, what, what's the name of this, this fermented uh, seagull thing? Um, kiviak. Okay, kiviak. So, kiviak. Something to avoid. <laughs> yes. Um, I have well, eaten it. My, my wife didn't eat it. I ate it. Yeah. So, but just coming back on the food, so you mentioned eating whale and seal, which I know in people's minds, um, West, you know, Western people, uh, yeah. those are emotional emotional creatures, let's say. And um, in terms of judgments, I guess, Western judgments around what is appropriate, um, how how would we act around, you know, people whose culture it is, and presumably also it's legal to, yep. to hunt whale um, and seals. Uh, so I guess how, how should we behave in a situation like that when it's acceptable in one culture and not another? I think uh, this is a really good question because I decided from day one that my first, uh, when I came to Greenland, I had to take two enormous steps back from everything that I believed and thought because I was in their country, it's their culture, and I had to learn and accept their ways if I was going to fit in. And it was very important for me to fit in. Um, so, you know, prior to coming to Greenland, I supported Greenpeace. Um, I now have different views on Greenpeace, but I must say they are not welcome in Greenland because many years ago when seals were being clubbed, that was a different country. That was actually happening in Canada. But the Greenlanders got tarred with the same brush. Now, what I do know is that um, kids from a very young age and hunters and everyone, they, they know they are so close to nature. They can tell you about a seal and everything about it. They can describe it in different ways that you and I can never begin to. Um, they know what the skeleton looks like. They know what the best parts are to eat and what parts you can make um, tools and um, jewelry out of. So when we say you mustn't do that, because that's wrong and that's, that's, you know, that's a wonderful animal. It is a wonderful animal or a sea mammal, but we don't know anything more than that. We don't know how they smell, how they move, how they, how they breathe. We don't see that um, the spout or the plume of, um, of, uh, of air from their bodies. We don't see that or we've seen it on TV. Mm. But the other thing is to the people I would meet in the helicopter helipads on the helipad or in a in a remote um, airport, they were the BBC crews for Frozen Planet. Um, isn't there a guy called Parry um, as well? As a anyway, it doesn't really matter. Mm. I met people where the BBC would come to film. That's the kind of place I lived. That's the kind of place they live in. So we're talking about a very different connection to nature. So if we respect that and begin to say, okay, I know nothing. If we start from nothing, we can only learn more. So I chose to keep my opinions to myself. I ate whale when it was offered to me. Um, and I took part in the things that I was in invited to take part in. Um, but you cannot judge. If, if you're going to judge as a traveler, I think this is, this is the same wherever you travel. If you travel to a place and you take your judgment, you know, judgmental ideas with you, you're never going to appreciate that place for who, uh, you know, who lives there and what it is. So my best advice for people to traveling to Greenland is leave, or leave everything behind. Take the baggage that you need and an open mind and take it from there. Come home, think about it and, you know, reevaluate and maybe you'll continue to think that whaling is wrong. And I don't advocate whaling at all, mm. but I'm going to write about it because it's a huge part of the Greenlandic culture. Yes, um, and, and also with a country of 58,000 people, as you said, the impact of any practice by 
a population so small in a country so large is nothing compared to, say, the population of Great Britain at, what, 65 million people in a country a lot smaller. Um, you know, I, I totally agree with you. We we can't we can't bring our judgments that way uh, if we're going to travel somewhere yeah. that is someone else's country. So I think we're just boiling down to respect uh, the Absolutely. locals' knowledge and their culture and, and the way they live. And if you don't want to eat something, then politely politely say no without that look on your face that <laughs> is judgmental. Is <laughs> Nothing is forced on you. I'll just say one one lovely thing about the Greenlanders is that they, they have a wonderful sense of humour. Okay, it's a very sweeping generalisation, but I went to one cafe mic where a hunter suggested that I try something and he pointed at this this bit of um, blubber. Basically, it's from the breast of a narvel. And he said, oh, you should try that. So I cut a square of it and popped it in my mouth and I could just feel this oil dripping mm. in. Yeah, you know, it's horrible. And then his, with a little smile on his lips, he said, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. <laughs> you could have told me that, but no, no. He wanted me to get the whole experience. Oh, so, um, well, it sounds, it sounds like you need a sense of humour. I mean, obviously, we need to talk about the weather. Let's just yes. um, talk about that because uh, when, when should people consider traveling and you know any other recommendations around packing for example <laughs> yes the challenge is that in the winter um it's very difficult to get around of course um because there will be either treacherous seas or or ice or you just can't get around so it's everything again you're flying but i would say april easter time is absolutely fantastic in the north because if we're lucky, then the, the sea ice is set and it's hard and it's good. And then you've got sun in the sky because it's returned after the period of darkness. And you can basically walk on the ice in, you know, if you're wearing salopettes and a t-shirt, you will be warm because the sun just beats down, reflects back off the ice and it's fabulous. Um, typically, people will travel to the Arctic in July and August. Um there are lots of mosquitoes. That's something you don't really think about in Greenland, but there are lots. Um, not so much in the towns and cities, but they are avail- yeah, available. Available. <laughs> They're very available <laughs> in the off the beaten track. Um, they don't have malaria, would... though. No, no. no so there's don't. just bi- bitey mosquitoes, but no bitey disease as such. Exactly. Mm. And then I did meet uh, a British guy from Oxford University. He and I were in Karnak at the same time. And his doctor had advised him prior to going that he needs to have all kinds of rabies jabs. You do not necessarily need rabies jabs. The dogs don't have rabies. Um, They might be a bit mad sometimes, but that's another matter. (laughs) But but in terms of traveling, I think the the south of Greenland, of course, you can go later because it's in the north, really, that the weather really hits. You've got really two seasons. You've got summer and you've got um, winter. Um, but further south, you've got more of a change in seasons. I would say if you go later in the summer period, if you, August, September, and you go to the capital of Nuuk, you will see wonderful northern lights. So the temperature will be good. There's a lot of rain in Nuuk, um, but the northern lights are there. And then if you fly to the main airport, which is an old American airbase called Gangschlusswak, which is just kind of in the middle, of Greenland, they're further down below the Arctic Circle. Again, it's a place where in winter you can get temperatures of minus 50 degrees C, but you will again have incredible northern lights. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's possible to, to not have to travel within the country so much and get the Greenlandic experience. And Gangsluswak is a place where people often go and they will get everything they want to experience about the nature, but they won't necessarily meet so many people. So, you know, it's, mm. it's more of a nature experience. But the weather, yes. I mean, where I lived in Klarnak, it could get down to minus 40 in the winter. And of course, the winter is pitch black. Sun disappears late October, comes back mid-February. Mm. And it's just black. Uh, you get used to it. Um, <laughs> you get used to it or, or you don't, I guess. But, um, you, but you it, don't have an option, actually. Mm, mm. You know, so. Yeah, so... Well, I mean, because you mentioned Northern Lights, and I think for many people like me, particularly, I would say that is one thing that I'm really interested in. I don't particularly like cold travel as such, but no. um, the Northern Lights have such a romantic thing about them, don't they? That pe- you know, people dream of seeing them 
uh, from everywhere. Yes. So, and what I've heard is that you can't just like book your trip for three days and expect to see them. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we want to see the Northern Lights, um, you know, is there you, like you've mentioned a place, but is it make sure you've got enough time because they don't just appear every night, for example? You do need time. It's not like you can, you, you can actually, I was about to say you can't predict it like you can predict the weather, but there are websites where you can look at the potential for Northern Lights in that area at that time. Um, I'll say the Northern Lights in Greenland, because it's higher up, you don't necessarily get the mix of colours, the purples and the blues. It's mostly green. Mm. And then the further north you go, the weaker the Northern Lights gets, which sounds, you know, contra- <laughs> it doesn't yeah, sound right. <laughs> But uh, and in Karnak, we rarely saw the Northern Lights because we're so far forward, so far north. Um, but in Umanak, I had this, yeah, I have to say, I had this amazing experience where I was on the rocks feeding my dogs in the dark in the winter. Northern Lights were in the sky. It was pitch black, and then I actually heard a shooting star and saw it. It was like a firework. Wow! It was amazing. And then there were whales in the sea, and I could hear and see them as well. So it's like, I really, if there's one thing that people take away from this podcast, it's that how close you are to nature in Greenland, all kinds of nature. And that's not even talking about ravens, you know, and and foxes and all all kinds of things, but so close to nature. Um, Mm. So, so I would say, yes, don't plan on seeing Northern Lights in three days. You'll be disappointed Um, at least a week. Um, But again, everything in Greenland is very expensive. So um, I think that's why it's still, it's not, it's not the most visited place yet. And the difficulty as well, the more, more people come there, the bigger the cruise ships, sometimes those cruise ships can have far more people than actually live in the town. Mm. I remember, you know, in, in Ulmanak, we were just over 2,000 people. The, the hospital was set up for 2,000 people. And there was only like two small rooms, uh, the wards. When a cruise ship came, we were in serious danger of being able to cope with them. My wife worked in a hospital. And the other thing is, at that time, there was only two, you know, if someone has a heart attack, there was only two um, doses of adrenaline. Oh, oh okay. No, the, <laughs> no adrenaline, actually. Um, <laughs> but the problem is the people on the cruise ships, they tend to be older because they're retired and they yes. have the money. Yeah. Um, Greenlanders are, aren't so prone to heart attack. And you could say that's a lot to do with their diet. Unfortunately, junk food is coming. Oh, it's, it's very much there. But they only have enough adrenaline to cope with perhaps one or two cases a year. As soon as a cruise ship turns up with lots of people in their 80s, <laughs> yeah, we got problems. Well, I think it's interesting because there is a, a rise in eco tourism, and I hope that there are more companies in Greenland that are doing that type of travel now. Um, yeah. You know, the cruise ship travel is one thing, but I, I think this type of eco travel w- would be would be a better way to see it. Really, yes. Um, again, it's difficult. Um, with the best intention in the world, you're still going to be restricted to how you actually get from one place to the other. Mm. Um, my brother-in-law was a guide on the East Coast once and the, the American tourists he had with him were quite disappointed that they couldn't fly on because of the fog. And that's when one of them said, can't we just get a taxi? <laughs> and, and my brother-in-law said, well, there are no taxis. Well, we'll just hire a car then. He said that there are no roads. <laughs> so, you know, you just can't, you are stranded. It is, um, ama- it is amazing. It sounds like an amazing place. And I mean, we, we could talk about this for ages, but uh, yeah, we, ne- we need to move on. So I want, I do want to direct people um, to your books because you really do evoke the place incredibly well and give this sense of, uh, I mean, the, word, the words themselves are really interesting, but the culture yeah. and, and everything. But apart from your books, um, and, you know, again, I'll mention Seven Graves, One Winter and The Ice Star, um, particularly, uh, which are the beginnings of of series um but what are some uh, some other books that you would recommend to people um about greenland or or the arctic yeah um barry lopez arctic dreams oh yes i love barry lopez I, he's actually one of my dream guests for the podcast yes <laughs> well you know you have to get him um one day i also love i also <laughs> love his of wolves and men fantastic mm. book so barry lopez arctic dreams it's a classic um it it explores the entire Arctic, um, and it's yeah, it's quite a weighty book. Um, but it's definitely if I was traveling to Greenland, I would take it with me. Um, Marie Herbert, Marie Herbert is the wife of Wally Herbert, British explorer. 
they lived on Herbert Island. And Herbert Island is, you can see it um, from where I lived in Karnak. I looked at it from my kitchen window. Marie Herbert's book is called The Snow People. And it talks about the year that she spent on Herbert Island while Wally Herbert was um, working or traveling with the, the hunters. And her daughter, Carrie Herbert, was there at the time. And she has written a book about her experiences there. Um, and then Peter Hoot, um, Smiller's Sense of Snow. Oh, in... yes. I actually had that down to ask about because I thought, oh, is that, yeah. the, is that the snow book? Yes. Yeah. Um, that, that for me, I mean... Some people don't like, I think the difficulty is when the film came, it's like everyone suddenly thought that the book was the same as the film. And it's a classic case of it's not. I mean, Smilla Jasp- Jasperson as the uh, the main character, uh, she's incredible. And she actually represents a lot of the issues like I've tried to do to identify things that Greenlanders are struggling with. Um, Smilla you know, encapsulates that. I mean, Peter Hu did a really good job of finding a lot of things to to talk about issues with mm. the Danish government and things. Um and then, um, I mean, it's it's more Arctic. It's it's. Have you read the the Terror by Dan Simmons? Oh yes, brilliant! Another brilliant oh, book. Yeah, it's fabulous. And I there's a lot of shamanism creeping into my books of late um, when I'm writing them. And you know, of course, that magical element which does fit into real life too is wonderful. And he just does that brilliantly in the Terror. So I definitely recommend that. Yeah, well, they, those are some fantastic recommendations, and and I do think you're right that that sense of being isolated and and some element of magic has to be there because it's just you know what what else do you do? You're this tiny little person on the edge of it's, the world. <laughs> you need very it very much so, very much so. Yeah, oh no, those there's some great book recommendations there. So um, before we finish up, I mean, you're British and you live in Denmark now, so. What what does travel mean to you and um, how, I guess, you I mean, you've talked about some of your trips, but what is travel and what is home, I guess, as someone who's lived all over the place? I think I, think I realised when I, or rather, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, uh, for me, travelling is about getting to know one place really, really well. Um, so even though you could say, well, you're not a traveler then I'm still, I'm still foreign. I'm still, it's not, you know, I'm stranger in a strange land as it were. And the longer you spend in that country, the less strange that land becomes. Um, so I think for me, traveling is about experiencing a culture, but also being able to contribute to that culture. Um, I really, the most rewarding I did, never liked the, re- the word rewarding because it was actually a job, but I really felt good about teaching kids in, in Greenland. I felt good about the feedback I got. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, teaching police academy students uh, in Greenland because I felt like I was giving something back. So for me, traveling is, is experiencing a place, um, getting to know that place and contributing to the community. So you don't just, you know, there's a lot of people, and this is especially in Greenland, there's a lot of people coming and going for short periods of time, often on short contracts. And the typical Greenlandic grudge they have with others, uh, with foreigners, is coming when the, the, the foreigner comes and gives a lot of good advice. You should do this to make your country better. Mm. And then they leave after two weeks or two months. Well, when you get a lot of people doing that, that gets old really quickly. So for me, traveling is about settling somewhere, respecting the people and also contributing. No, oh, that's, that's fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? My books are available on Amazon and I have a Wolf series, which is available wide um, on the different, on Apple and, and uh, Kobo, different platforms. My website is Christopher with two Fs dash Peterson.com. And that's where I try and gather most things brilliant well thanks so much for your time chris that was great thank you for having me it's you know it's been a pleasure thanks for joining me today on the books and travel podcast i hope you found a moment of escape you can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page and if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free Happy travels until next time.